Hey now everyone, before we get started with this breakdown of the Acolyte episode 4, spoilers, spoiler! The Acolyte continued to weave its very intriguing and mysterious narrative this week with what I believe to be the most well-rounded episode to date in Day. For the first time this season, I didn't feel myself saying, something feels off about the overall production value, be it the writing, the performances, or the direction of the scenes. This episode just seemed to flow better and felt very Star Wars prequel era-ish, especially the salacious scenes with the Jedi Small Council. Above all, this episode did a great job at laying the groundwork yet again for how the benevolent Jedi Order could allow their greatest rivals to rise and gain unlimited power right under their noses. Hubris was leaking through my screen watching them all debate the possibility of a splinter order without even considering they could be Sith. Then they all agree to keep it secret so they don't cause fear and mistrust from the galaxy they're sworn to defend. They're so blinded by the Jedi way that they can't even compute an apprentice not knowing their master's identity as being something very Sith-like. They don't even mutter the word because they literally refuse to believe that any other Force user in the universe could be anything but a former Jedi. Vernestra even confidently says that she knows May has been trained by a Jedi. Well, wasn't there another order that split from the Jedi who had ideas of their own on how to use the Force and how to train others to embrace its dark side? I mean, their downfall, if it hadn't already started, began in this episode. Hell, we may be able to put a large amount of the blame of Master Soul and Master Ro when this is all said and done because these two seem quite fine with white lies to their order and are content with lying about it to their superiors. Not very Jedi-like at all. I will say that Kamir continues to be a standout character, and it's starting to feel like the writers are going out of their way to show that he's not just Kamir, and more than likely he's Kylo Grin, aka Darth Tease, aka Abela Superfan, aka the Star Wars Gimp, and I digress. His tone in the conversation points he has with May are just so obviously coming from his hidden personality that I wonder if him being Kylo Gren is too obvious making it an impossibility. But based on some stills from the encounter in this episode, the supposed Sith does have masculine looking arms and hands and appears to have slapped his outfit on rather hastily as he's nude underneath his poncho. I will stick with my OG theory that the helmet wearing, red saber wielding baddie is Kamir, but like I speculated back then, he is not the master like May and everyone else thinks. He's the apprentice recruiting his acolyte in May to take out his actual master, which I hope and really should be George Cannon wise, Darth Plagueis. That, or he's a rival Sith apprentice trying to take out a rival master. But either way, Plagueis' involvement has to be present in my mind so we can get a clear through line to what Palpatine's master was up to before he ever took on Sheev, unknowingly creating the most successful Sith master of all time in him. The episode did lose its way a bit once the Jedi reached Kofor. Because like them searching for May, the pacing just felt like it started to meander, worse than you were trying to lead a group of Jedi through a massive forest. A bit of this series' patented wonkiness cropped up in these moments, but not enough to make me question the overall quality of the production like I've done in the past. Alright, top moments time. I have to start with the Jedi Small Council, or what should be known as the Jedi Shady Council, am I right? Like I mentioned before, this scene just did a perfect job at highlighting how the Jedi of this era were so overly confident in their ways that they couldn't see a Sith threat right in front of their faces. They refuse to even utter the word, and can only imagine it's a splinter Jedi Order training people in the Jedi arts. There's no consideration given for the chance that their long thought extinct foils could have returned. These Jedi, led by Vernestra Rowe, are so concerned about the bad politics of it all that they're willing to lie and keep the ordeal secret from their own high council. Think about that for real. Multiple Jedi Masters agreed to hide the fact that someone trained like a Jedi is killing Jedi and they don't know who their master is to boot. Poor Kiati Mundi tries to do the right thing, but he's shot down. No wonder he has strong convictions about the Sith being extinct in TPM, because he's partly complicit in what is looking like a Jedi cover-up, and he, like the rest, could only believe it was a splintered Jedi faction, not the Sith. 
So, yeah, he clearly wasn't thinking this is Sith-related, and based on how things are already being swept under the rug, it's not a stretch to think that when this is all said and done, that if any of these people in the know survive, they've committed to keeping it all secret from the Order at large. And the final top moment is obviously the arrival of Kylo Grin, a.k.a. Darth Happy. Okay, I'll stop. How freaking cool was that entrance? I mean, things got a little horror-like in Star Wars, which was awesome, but the visuals were just creepy and powerful. I didn't get Mary Poppins vibes at all. It just seemed like a dark side user flexing like we know they like to do when they make an entrance. The tense standoff with Osha, the shock of the Jedi, then to see the sheer power of this Khmer guy, I mean this Sith, who is an apprentice by the way, this is not the master everyone thinks they are, just all made this encounter amazing to witness. Upon further review, the character does appear to be a man based on the exposed arms and hands, so him being Khmer is very likely. My out of left field guess would be Mother Coral because we still need her ultimate fate to be revealed, but Khmer just makes a ton of sense. Hopefully not too much sense. I do feel like the real twist will be that he's not the master, rather the apprentice recruiting an acolyte to take out his master, which again, I hope, is Plagueis, or I'd even take Tenebris. And now for some references. Hey, first time seeing a Jedi Wookiee in Jedi robes in live action, right? Right? And this isn't an Aga reference to other Star Wars, but hopefully everyone saw the clear yin and yang references in his hovel. Not to mention the witch coven symbolism that matches the tattoos they had from their ascensions. I've been saying all along the twins are a true yin and yang, so hopefully we'll get more on that motif moving forward. Hey, he even has a bowcaster. I wonder if Chewie hooked him up because you know he's alive at this time. Kiati Mundi, and he still seems like a gruff Jedi with a bit of snootiness about him. I know some are bent over him being there, but who cares? He's an alien in a fantasy show, so he can live as long as he wants. Plus, it's Kiati Mundi, and his head isn't as long. There was also a Kaldor Jedi, but he is not Plo Koon, just a lookalike thanks to the breathing mask they have to wear. And lastly, our buddy Basil is a Tynan which is a race first canonized in Catalyst, a Rogue One novel. Hey, thanks for watching. Be kind to someone today online, why don't you? If you don't mind, give this video a like, leave a comment, and share it with a friend or 50. Please consider joining as a subscriber or a full member using the buttons below. There's always time for Star Wars time, and when you listen to the Star Wars time show, the Force will be with you, always.